Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions. The first portfolio is real economy. Can I remind members that questions one and three will be grouped together. Question one, Liam Kerr, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what criteria it is using to determine whether £160 million of convergence funding is allocated. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Hume. I welcome the UK Government's commitment that they will right an historic wrong and repay the £160 million convergence funds to Scotland. I have already said, Presiding Officer, that these monies are ring-fenced in Scotland for agriculture and I've made it clear that many of those who are in the greatest need are those who farm in our marginal uplands, our hill farms, and our island areas. It's therefore right that they should benefit from the convergence monies. Uh, however, I am still waiting for the UK government to deliver on this commitment. Liam Kerr. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with Scottish Farmer that the bulk of that money should go to land areas two and three, or should it be used across all sectors of agriculture? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, I, I, as I said, the convergence monies were intended for Scotland. They should have been paid to Scotland. They should have been paid to Scotland over the period from 2014 and 2020. And I think it's right that... Well, the Tories are complaining about that, but it was their Tory government that did not pay that money. So it's a bit off that they're grumbling about it now. Um, but, but we shall, of course, consider extremely carefully how, how best and most appropriately those funds have been dispersed. And I've already met various parties and I'm listening to views. But it's right that we help those who are in greatest need, who farm in our marginal uplands, our hill farms and our island areas. Question three, David Torrance. I agree that the Tory government needs to hand over its funding as quickly as possible to allow us to get it to the farmers and crosslers. We need it most. Can the cabinet I, I'm sorry, you must begin with the question as is on the Apolog bulletin. Apologies. I reprimand you for that. Okay, apologies. Um, to ask the Scottish government when it expects to receive 160 million in convergence funding. Cabinet secretary. Uh, well, the, the position is that the UK government has said that 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 money would not be paid until the next financial year. Uh, the Scottish Government is therefore writing to the Chancellor uh, to state that this money should be paid now. And the reason for that is this, that most budgetary matters are a matter of judgment, a matter of judgment as to how taxpayers' money is dispersed. This is not in that category. This is writing a wrong, writing a wrong and historic injustice, uh, which in the Prime Minister has said must be corrected. There is no excuse for money that's wrongfully been withheld to be withheld for a further six or nine months, presiding officer. That should be paid over now, and the sooner it's paid, of course, the sooner we are able uh, to make plans to disperse it to those who most need it. I'm astonished that the Scottish Tories don't want this money now. It's absolutely shocking, uh, and I invite them to reflect uh, on their position. David Torrance, briefly. Thank you, President Officer. I agree that the Tory government needs to hand over its funding as quickly as possible to allow us to get it to the farmers and crosslers who need it the most. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what else he is doing to make sure that we have as much financial certainty ahead of Scotland being dragged out of the EU, potentially with a harmful no deal Brexit on the 31st of October? Cabinet Secretary, briefly, please. Uh, well, just a, a yesterday, a Presiding Officer, we initiated the payments totalling, I believe, £327 million uh, by way of the loan payments to those farmers and crofters who returned their acceptance forms by uh, the 27th of September. Uh, that is to over 13,400 farmers and crofters, and I think it represents uh, between 75 and 80 per cent of those who returned their loan offer. That payment of 327 million, so far as I know, presiding officer, uh, is the largest single payment to any group of people anywhere in Britain, which will effectively mitigate against the potentially catastrophic consequences of a no deal Brexit. And I'm truly grateful to the Scottish Civil Service who are so efficiently administering this vital aid. 
Uh, Colin Smith, briefly, please. Thank you, President Officer. Given that the Cabinet Secretary has just said that he believes this money should be paid right now by the Scottish Government, can he tell us when he'll set out exactly how he believes that money should be allocated? Because farmers are waiting to have that answer from the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we are working on that now, and uh, we have been working on it uh, in the re relatively short period since it was announced by the Chancellor in his autumn statement that the money would be paid. Uh, but of course, uh, unless it is paid now, we can't pay it. The cheque is not only not in the post, it's not yet signed. And that's why I would hope that all of this House would unite behind the task of uh, obtaining this money now without further delay. Uh, after all, this money has been wrongfully withheld by successive uh, UK governments, which they've admitted, although the Scottish Tories appear to challenge that, their London counterparts... Uh, the London counterparts have admitted that. The Scottish Tories appear to still cavil at that. Uh, but we are working very hard in order to determine how best the uh, funding should be issued. I do not believe a formal consultation should take place because that would, uns would almost certainly delay the ability to disperse funds until possibly next, uh, the decision about how to disperse funds until possibly next year. Uh, and obviously, I will keep the House fully informed about our progress. I please think this is very important, but it's taken over six minutes just to get through two questions. I'd like to get through more. Question two, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government how many farm holdings will have support payments withheld as a result of unresolved disputes regarding land parcel identification system mapping process. Cabinet Secretary. A presenting officer, we're not aware of any farm holdings that will have support payments withheld as a result of unresolved disputes. Uh, regarding the land parcel identification system mapping process. However, it should be noted that although we are not aware of any specific unresolved farmer issues regarding our uh, LIPIS mapping system, we annually review and update thousands of map changes. Therefore, should there be any such case which has not yet been highlighted to us, we will be keen to review any such case and resolve any issue that any farmer or crofter may have. Finley Carson. Uh, thanks for that response. Uh, huge concerns have been raised with me regarding out-of-date aerial photographs and ordnance survey maps being used as the basis of decision-making um, in, the, in the process. Uh, errors have been made where parcels of land were removed, letters sent stating it was ineligible, and data being used from 2017, even when pipeline construction uh, has, has, has now been farmed. Will the Cabinet Secretary give me a commitment today that the most up-to-date data will be used to identify land parcels and ensure timely site visits are carried out where appropriate? Cabinet Secretary. Well, from extensive visits to the ARPID offices throughout the country, uh, from many, many lengthy hours of discussion with the people who carry out this work, I, I think their professionalism is something that we should all respect and admire, uh, not challenge and cavil at. Uh, if uh, the member has any individual case, and I'm not aware he has actually written to me on any of these matters, I mean, members should actually raise individual cases rather than just make general smearing accusations. But if he has any individual cases, of course, I will look into them. Question four, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact has been on the rural economy of reductions to local authority services. Cabinet Secretary. The funding of local authority services is the responsibility of indi individual local authorities. Uh, in 2019 to 2020, the Scottish Government is delivering a funding package of uh, £11.2 billion for local authorities, which represents, uh, presiding officer, a real terms increase of £310 million, or 2.9%. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The passing of cuts to councils by this government has resulted in severe cuts across all communities. Rural communities need investment in roads, in transport and in infrastructure to attract new business opportunities and a strong workforce. How does the Scottish Government expect the rural economy to grow and attract inward investment when councils who fund no, the infrastructure no, that's, we're, we're all cuts. Sorry, we're all drifting into very long questions and people are not getting in. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I do think the question is really primarily from my local government colleague, but I, I can inform the member that uh, the funding available to local authority has been increased, not reduced, and therefore the fundamental premise 
of her question is one which we do not accept. And indeed, in the west of Scotland, uh, East Renfrewshire has received an additional 7.6 million, Inverclyde 8.2 million, North Ayrshire 31, Renfrewshire 19.9. I could go on, presiding officer, but I think the point has been made. Julian Martin. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to comment on the fact that the loss of people working in key rural sectors and local communities is a real threat to our rural economy and public services? And can you tell me what the Scottish Government is doing to encourage EU nationals to stay in rural Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I agree with Julia Martin. The programme for government sets out our commitment to stem rural depopulation, including establishing a cross-portfolio ministerial task force. Um, but of course, uncertainty relating to Brexit uh, continues to be a significant threat to rural Scotland. For example, uh, over 90% of vets in our abattoirs are EU nationals. So our Stay in Scotland campaign recognises the vital importance of EU nationals to Scotland and the rural uh, economy, uh, and this provides essential advice and support to help them remain here as they are very welcome. Question five, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports the food and drink sector in Glasgow. Minister Mary Goujon. Direct investment and support from the public sector, which helps promote the food and drink sector in Scotland, equates to approximately £100 million a year across a range of different areas, including skills, education, research, industry development, standards and capital investment. And this funding is provided on a national basis and would be available to any business based in Glasgow. And the Scottish Government has also made food processing, marketing and cooperation grant awards to projects <coughs> in Glasgow, totalling 2.31 million since 2012. Bob Doris. President officer, I draw the Minister's attention to the social enterprise Launch Foods, who use quality produce that otherwise may go to waste to provide free and nutritious uh, primary school meals in my constituency. Can I ask the Minister how the sector can do more to reduce food waste and if we should come out and see the great work of Launch Foods in my constituency? Minister. I'd be happy to because I think it sounds like an absolutely fantastic initiative uh, and I very much welcome the work that Launch Foods are carrying out in Bob Doris's constituency because they play their part within our commitment to reduce food waste by 33% by 2025. Now we recently announced an additional £1 million investment in the food redistribution charity Fair Share to increase the help that they provide to organisations who are responding to food insecurity and that investment builds on work undertaken in the spring and it's in addition to the direct grant funding that we provide community food initiatives through their food, Fair Food Fund. And also in addition to that, the importance of increasing local food uh, provision within public sector procurement contracts is one of the key reasons that we support the Food for Life programme with the Soil Association. Uh, that programme has made a massive difference to the lives of young people right across the country because by signing up to that, schools are guaranteeing that our young people access healthy and sustainable food that's been grown, sourced and produced in Scotland. Neil Finlay followed by Willie Rennie. Uh, will the Minister and the Government introduce mandatory, mandatory reporting of food and drink waste? Minister. Is that something I would be happy to discuss with the member? Willie Rennie. Um, this summer I spent the day at East Grangemuir Farm near Pitt and Weem picking strawberries just to understand about the impacts of the shortage of workers on that sector. Uh, I'd be interested to hear from the Minister what discussions she's had with the UK Government about making sure there are sufficient workers for the sector to succeed. Minister. I would say to, in response to the member, we have monthly meetings with the other administrations of the UK, where this is a point that is continually highlighted. Because while we've seen the introduction of the Seasonal Workers Agricultural Scheme, which introduced 2,500 workers for the whole of the UK, Scotland's share of that is only 650. And to put that in context, in my constituency, well, if you to look at the whole of Angus, we have about 9,500 yeah. seasonal workers alone. So it's absolutely shocking the number that we've uh, been allocated through this anyway. And the UK government has to wake up and recognise how important this is to us in Scotland and take action on it. Question six, Joe McAlpine. To ask the Scottish Government what has been done to protect the forestry industry from the threat of tree diseases and pests such as oak processionary moths and bark beetles. Minister. 
The Scottish Government is working closely with other administrations across the UK to safeguard Scotland's forests, which play an absolutely vital role in our response to the climate emergency and supporting the rural economy. Now, we've implemented strength and protection by introducing emergency statutory measures to restrict the movement of larger oak trees, which have the highest risk of carrying oak processionary moth. And we've also undertaken surveillance to monitor tree diseases, including damaging bark be beetles and taken action, including statutory measures to contain any outbreaks. Jo McAlpine. Thank you. I welcome that answer. We have seen recent incursions into Scotland of oak processionary moth, which causes allergic reactions in susceptible people and animals. If the closely related pine processionary moth was imported, it would have terrible um, ramifications for Scotland's unique Caledonian pine forest. Ensuring that growers use assurance schemes to make sure only UK sourced and grown trees are planted can help prevent the spread of this disease. Does the Scottish Government support such assurance schemes? Minister. I do, and I would say I'm glad that Joan McAlpine raises some of those points there because that shows why our plant health and tree health surveillance measures are so vitally uh, important. Um, because with oak processionary moth, it does carry a public and animal health risk. Now, our border control measures right now are based on risk management, and our modelling suggests that pine processionary moth isn't well suited to the current climatic conditions that we have here in Scotland. However, the use of UK sourced and grown plant material will reduce those risks still further. So that is why we welcome the development of any assurance schemes and my officials are engaged in those processes. Question seven, Andy Wells. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the new agricultural tenancy legislation is having on the number of farm tenancies. Cabinet Secretary. Since the Land Reform Scotland Act 216 has come into force, there has been a 5% reduction in agricultural tenancies, which uh, is part of a long-term downward trend in the number of secure heritable tenancies, but some of the changes have been positive. For example, 30 holdings appear to have purchased their land. There has also been an increase in other types of tenancies during this time. Limited duration tenancies have increased by 18%, and short limited duration tenancies have increased by 10%. The Act also introduced, presiding officer, modern limited duration tenancies. These came into force on 30th November 2017, and by June 2018, there were already 28 of them in existence. Annie Wells. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what measures the Scottish Government has taken to extend this scheme to new entrant farmers and whether this has been successful? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can say to the member that through, through the SRDP, we have already invested £24 million to help kickstart over 250 new agricultural businesses and fund over 850 new business development projects. And over the same time, we have provided over 90 new business opportunities through access to publicly owned land. And looking ahead, the new land matching service for Scotland, which I launched at a farm near Dunblane on Friday of last week, also offers opportunities to bring new entrants into agriculture. Angus MacDonald. Yeah, thanks, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise the Chamber what else the Scottish Government's done and is doing uh, to encourage more people to enter farming? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, of course, we work with uh, all stakeholders including the NFUS, who are very active in this area, and we uh, uh, appreciate their efforts. Uh, we do believe that the land matching service offers opportunities uh, to bring together outgoing with potential incoming farmers and crofters, and that, uh, ha that has much potential. In addition to that, the phone initiative, Farming Opportunities for New Entrants, uh, which is headed up by Henry Graham, has also identified uh, many units, largely small units, but many potential farming units uh, from publicly owned land, owned by various public sector bodies. So there's a whole variety of things the government is doing, uh, uh, and we will continue to work with all stakeholders to see what more can be done. Thank you. That ends questions on rural economy and uh, because question eight wasn't lodged. And we want questions on transport, infrastructure and connectivity. Question one, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it provide an update on its programme to improve broadband connectivity in the Stirling constituency. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. 
<laughs> uh, latest Think Broadband figures show that superfast broadband access in Stirling has increased by 34 percentage points over the past five years, from 56.5 per cent in January 2014 to 90.5 in September 2019. Latest assured figures show that 14,482 premises are now connected as a direct result of our Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband programme. Commercial coverage has also played an important role in improving broadband connectivity, and I welcome plans by commercial operators such as City Fibre, who have committed to making Stirling the UK's first gigabit city, and have had the pleasure of seeing this, uh, the build-out of this when I recently visited Stirling myself. Bruce Crawford. The Minister confirmed that while Cray and Larrach will not be part of the main R100 programme, but instead a bespoke solution is being developed to ensure superfast broadband is brought to the village, the result being that superfast broadband is like delivered in Cray and Larrach ahead of the main R100 programme, and that given that broadband is the responsibility of the UK Government, it is the height of hypocrisy for Tory politicians to attack this proposal. Minister. Well, uh, can I first of all start by agreeing very much with Bruce Crawford on the point he makes about the hypocrisy of some in this place and those uh, elsewhere, another place, who, um, who do appear to be uh, criticising the Scottish Government when the Prime Minister is already backtracking his own weeks old commitment around uh, the full fibre by 2025. But seriously, Bruce Crawford also makes a very important point around telecommunications being wholly reserved to Westminster in terms of legislative and regulatory powers. But despite this, we've made a real commitment uh, to ensure that every home and business across, across Scotland can access superfast broadband, a commitment we have backed up with our £600 million R100 programme, with 96.5% of the funding for that programme being met by the Scottish Government. And whilst we are disappointed on his point around uh, Cree and Lark, that a solution cannot be delivered to Cree and Lark through DSSB itself, the programme, as I, I know I've corresponded with Mr Crawford, has been hugely successful, delivering fibre broadband across access to over 936,000 premises, which is 100,000 premises is more than originally anticipated and we're working with Stirling Council, I want to reassure Bruce Crawford and this, to identify a solution for Cree and Larrick to R100 which could result in superfast broadband as he said being delivered to the village in advance of the main R100 programme. So we're committed to ensuring that every home yeah. uh, and business in Scotland including in Stirling uh, can access superfast broad and, uh, broadband and that is what we intend to deliver. Finley Carson. In, in June, the Minister confirmed further delays to R100, but saying he anticipated the announcement of a bidder by the end of September. Well, this is the 2nd of October. Will the Minister assure the Parliament there'll be, that the R100 programme is still on schedule? Minister. I can certainly assure Finlay Carson that we are very close to making a significant announcement around the R100 procurement, uh, and I hope that will be very soon. Uh, we are going through the evaluation of the tenders, as he knows, and uh, apologies, it's not happened by the end of September, but it should be very soon. And I hope there's very positive news for, for Mr. Carson and indeed other, uh, other uh, colleagues who are across the chamber. We said from the outset this process uh, is going to be highly complex. It's been our main objective to deliver a competitive procurement process to try and get best value for, for money out of the process. I'm confident we will get good value. Uh, for Mr Carson's constituency and other areas of the south of Scotland, but I hope he can be patient with me that hopefully we very soon will be able to give him the announcement he's looking for. Question to Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on planned improvements to the A92 in the Glenrothes area. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. Uh, the Scottish Government through Transport Scotland will continue to engage with the community on the development of improvements to the A92 at Cadham and Balfarg. Glenrothes. Further to Transport Scotland officials meeting with the North Glenrothes Community Council on the 27th of August, a meeting will be arranged in March to provide further information on the plans being developed for the Balfour Junction. In the meantime, our operating company, Bayer Scotland, are working to deliver the short-term measures at both the Balfour and Cadham Junctions and will undertake any necessary public consultation on these matters. Jenny Gilruth. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The news that road improvements are scheduled to go ahead on the A92 was certainly warmly welcomed by my constituents, including the Glenrothes Area Futures Group, who have campaigned on this issue for a number of years. But can the Cabinet Secretary provide um, more of a detailed timeline in terms of when he expects the work approved at uh, Balfarg and at Cadham in particular to complete? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, I know that officials have discussed a range of short and long term upgrades for the A92 near Glenrothes. Uh, the short term improvements should be delivered by the end of this year, uh, subject to stakeholders' consultation and agreement with them. Uh, the most substantial proposals involved uh, relating to major junction improvements require further development. 
uh, and will be considered in any future year budget allocations. As it stands at the present time, our operating company have programmed the detailed design of these improvements, uh, primarily the signalisation of the junction at Balfarg and Fruke uh, for completion by the end of this financial year. And following this, Transport Scotland officials uh, will then meet with the community to provide a further update on the longer term items. Question three, Margot Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in completing the snagging work on the Queensferry crossing, which is due to be completed by the end of the year, and whether this will lead to roadworks. Cabinet Secretary. I'm pleased to report that good progress has been made with the snagging work on the Queensferry crossing. The tower lifts and the tower concrete finishing works are nearing completion, and under deck painting is well advanced. As I reported to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on the 11th of September, the contractor has advised that snagging work will be completed by the end of the, this year, weather permitting. Uh, traffic management will continue to be required at times to enable safe access by operatives when undertaking these works. All works requiring traffic management is undertaken overnight to minimise disruption to road users. Murdo Fraser. I can thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Uh, last night I drove across the Queen's Ferry Crossing around 9.30pm. The northbound carriageway was down to one lane, uh, and this is a frequent occurrence, as the Cabinet Secretary will know, causing a great deal of frustration to my constituents in Fife, particularly when there are traffic delays as a result. I'm sure he'll understand uh, the frustration and concern that there is that a bridge that has been open uh, for two years to the public is still facing the large programme of works that are causing these delays. What guarantees can you give my constituents that these works will not extend past the end of the year? And can you indicate to us uh, how the cost of these snagging works is well, being met? Is it part of the contract or is it an additional cost to the yeah, taxpayer? Get a move on with it though, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, the costs are actually met by the contractor because they are uh, snagging works and I'm sure the member will also recognise the very significant benefit that has been gained from the opening of the Queensferry Crossing over two years now. There have been in at least 34 occasions when the fourth road bridge would have been closed to high-sided vehicles when the Queensferry Crossing has been able to continue to operate. And I'm sure the member welcomes the additional resilience that's provided to his constituents and those uh, beyond his own region uh, in being able to make a crossing over the fourth during adverse weather. Uh, the member will also uh, be aware that the traffic management deployed for uh, the works which have been undertaken by operative operatives uh, cannot commence before eight o'clock in the evening. Uh, and even at that, it can be delayed if the evening peak uh, continues for an extended period. Uh, and there have been instances where the traffic management system has not been engaged until 10 o'clock at night in order to allow traffic flows to uh, reduce. But I'm sure the member will also recognise that in big uh, projects of this nature, piece of infrastructure, there will always be snagging work that should be uh, undertaken and that will occur after the, uh, the actual uh, piece of infrastructure is in use. But they will also recognise that we have to appreciate the health and safety needs of those who are operatives operating on the bridge and to put in place appropriate measures to consider their welfare while this work is being complete. And that's exactly why the traffic management system is required in these instances. Question four, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it has taken to encourage increased use of bus services. Cabinet Secretary. The programme for government was, uh, in the programme for government, we committed to a step change in bus investment over half a billion pounds uh, on bus priority to tackle negative impact of congestion on bus services. Investment in bus priority will make services faster and more reliable, which will in turn encourage more people to take the bus. This unprecedented investment will support the implementation of the Transport Bill, which provides a range of tools for local transport authorities to improve bus services. Bill Kidd. I thank the Cabinet, Minister, uh, Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Will, how will the Scottish Government target residential areas of Glasgow so that people out with the city centre can have access to convenient and sustainable travel options. Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, the member may be aware that the Transport Bill, which we will be debating uh, this time next week uh, for its stage three, uh, provides a range of tools for local authorities to employ in order to improve bus services within their area. Uh, at its very heart is a new statutory 
bus partnership model, uh, the bus service improvement uh, partnership, which enables local authorities to work with bus operators and others to improve bus services within their area. And this is a measure which has been provided within the bill to deal with the very specific issues uh, that uh, my colleague raises. Uh, the investment additionally of over £500 million in bus priority infrastructure uh, will include a bus partnership fund uh, to support the implementation of the bill so that local authorities can tackle congestion which can help to leverage improvements into bus services within cities. Colin Swift, briefly please. Officer, as we head towards stage three of the transport bill, the government appears to have accepted Labour's calls to allow local councils to establish and run local bus services directly, which I very much welcome. But does the Cabinet Secretary accept that, having recognised the value of municipal bus services, making that positive policy work will require financial support from the government to meet, in particular, the substantial start-up costs? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member will be aware that stage two, the Scottish Government brought forward measures in order to allow local authorities to be able to provide bus services. And I do welcome the fact that the committee supported that. And I know the members' uh, amendment sought to take that further. Uh, and next week, we'll have an opportunity to look at the new provisions which the Scottish Government is introducing to extend that even further. But the member will also recognise that it's for local authorities to determine how they deliver bus services within their local area. And so should they choose to make investments into the provision of buses, then that is a matter for them to choose to uh, do so. However, the unprecedented over half a billion pounds of investment we are putting into bus prioritisation is a key step change in helping to support local authorities in improving bus services within their local area in order to improve services to local residents. Question five, Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what coordination discussions it's had with the City of Edinburgh Council, bus companies and businesses regarding congestion during the Edinburgh festivals this year. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government through Transport Scotland has had discussions with transport providers as part of the Edinburgh International Festivals Transport Forum to improve connectivity to and within Edinburgh during major events. Traffic congestion within Edinburgh is the City Council's responsibility. They have a duty under the Road Scotland Act 1984 to manage local roads. The recently announced significant new funding to improve bus priority infrastructure will also support local authorities to tackle the impact of congestion on bus services. Jeremy Balfour. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? According to uh, the bosses at Lothian Buses, this year's festivals was the worst ever. Clearly, the SNP Labour administration here in Edinburgh, due to its incompetence, cannot be able to manage the situation. So would the Scottish Government commit to leading a joined-up approach to ensuring such problems can be managed so that the people of Edinburgh don't face the same problems next year. Cabinet Secretary. Epstein Officer, uh, given the state of the UK, government competence is not always a strong point for the Conservative Party to major on, to be perfectly frank. However, the matter is probably better addressed to the local authority for which he represents this area uh, within the region of Lothians. It would be better to address his issues directly to them where they've got responsibilities for these matters. Gordon MacDonald, briefly, please. In order to help councils tackle congestion in Edinburgh during peak periods, can the Cabinet Secretary outline how measures announced in the programme for government will support local authorities to prioritise park and ride facilities, such as the one at Hermiston in my constituency? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sign officer, I know this is a, a matter which the member has raised uh, previously, and as we've highlighted within our draft national transport strategy, uh, bus will play a key role in our future sustainable transport offer for the public. Uh, the investment which I've made uh, reference to several times now of uh, over half a billion pounds to support uh, bus infrastructure through the Bus Partnership Fund is there to help to support local transport authorities in transforming how they can uh, provide bus services within their area and tackle issues of congestion which have a direct impact on the quality of the services which bus operators are able to provide and in particular tackling the very negative issues that can impact on and congestion and park and ride facilities are an important contribution to helping to make that work effectively. Question six, Will Bowman. I thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what cost-benefit analysis has been undertaking on building the Dundee Northern Relief Road since the fourth Strategic Transport Projects Review was published. Cabinet Secretary. The first Strategic Transport Projects Review published in December 20, 2008 uh, included a part as part of the detailed options appraisal, the calculation of a scheme cost benefit ratio for the Dundee Northern 
Rayleigh Road. I can confirm that Transport Scotland have not undertaken any further analysis since the publication of STPR in 2008. The second STPR, which is now underway, will reappraise the need for any improvements at this location in order to confirm that it remains a priority within the wider strategic transport network in Scotland. Bill Bowman. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that admission and update. In July, local press reported a single van toppled over in the southbound stretch of Forfa Road at Clever House and caused a closure of all lanes into Dundee for nearly three hours and gridlock on the A90. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me and agree with the 75% of readers of one newspaper survey that this situation is unacceptable for a city in the 21st century and will he look into an urgent upgrade of Dundee's road and infrastructure? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so enough, sir, any accident on our uh, roads is uh, to be regretted and that's why we have a very clear strategy at looking at reducing uh, road traffic accidents on Scottish roads and over recent years through our strategy we have been successful in, being, uh, in seeking to do so. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, any future investment in the trunk road network within the Dundee area uh, will be considered as part of the STPR2 uh, process. However, in relation to local roads within Dundee, that is a matter for the local authority. Question 7, Anna Sarwar. Ask the Scottish Government what its response is to ScotRail failing to meet its customer satisfaction targets for the second year running. Cabinet Secretary. It's disappointing that ScotRail failed to attain the overall satisfaction key performance indicator. However, it is worth noting that ScotRail franchise is one of the few franchises in the UK to have specific key performance indicators linked to the National Rail Passenger Survey. It Transport Scotland holds rail, uh, ScotRail to account through the contractual requirements specified in the franchise agreement as evidenced by the remedial plan notice on the 8th of February. The commitments contained in the overall satisfaction remedial plan are specifically aimed at addressing the areas identified by passengers and driving up satisfaction levels. Anna Sarwar. Uh, uh, Minister, I, I think you failed to understand the facts. The Abellio franchise is a catalogue of failure delays, cancellations, overcrowded trains and skip stops. Since Abellio took over the franchise, there has been 75,000 train calculations, an average of 47 a day. That's 60% higher than when Abellio took over. What will it take for the minister to take the contract away from failing Abellio? Cabinet Secretary. Senator, uh, I'd like to hear this, please. You're debating it this afternoon. As it stands at the present moment, sign officer, we will use the contract in order to make sure we apply the necessary penalties and to require the necessary changes to the existing franchise. But as we, as is very clear, presiding officer, um, this is a Labour Party who called for the uh, public ownership of our railways, and tonight, tonight, every single one of them will have the opportunity to vote for exactly that with the Scottish government's amendment. But what I suspect it will do, sign officer, what I suspect it will do is they will go into voting with the Conservative Party to make sure that this Parliament and this government doesn't have the power to run a public railway in Scotland. <laughs> and as we know with the Labour Party, they say one thing out there, but when it comes into this Parliament, they never ever deliver on that. The time will be shown at five o'clock tonight where they stand up for their principles or where they run into voting with a Conservative Party to keep the existing rail infrastructure we have at the present time. Question eight, Willie Coffey, I think this might be most sedate. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will give an indicative timescale for the electrification of the Kilmarnock to Glasgow rail line. Cabinet Secretary. As committed in the programme for government in spring 2020, we will publish an action plan for decarbonising Scotland's railways by 2035. The primary focus will be the continuation of a rolling programme of efficient electrification, the procurement of battery trains and the development of hydrogen cell propulsion trains. Further details on how these may affect specific routes will be set out in the action plan. In the immediate term, we will be working closely with our industry partners to identify opportunities for increasing capacity on the Glasgow to Kilmarnock route to ensure passenger demand is met. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The investment made by the SNP government in the half-hourly service some years ago provided a huge boost to my constituents, but journey times on this line are on a par with what they were during the steam age due to the single track section of this particular line. 
Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that this really needs to improve and be brought into the 21st century to meet the needs of a modern travelling public? Cabinet Secretary. Now, officer, the member raises a, an important point and I recognise the concerns which he raises. But these are matters which he's previously uh, raised directly with me. O on the Kilmarnock route in particular, uh, there has uh, been a significant uh, growth in demand and the uh, delivery of performance on that route has continued to be consistently above the 92.5% overall PPM. In addition, by the end of this year, all of the trains used on the route will have completed their upgrade work to provide modern train facilities such as new seating, flooring, power sockets and Wi-Fi, which, I would, which passengers would expect in a modern rolling stock. Overall, uh, above this, uh, we're also uh, looking at taking forward further support to improve the rolling stock upgrade programme, uh, which I know also supports important jobs within his local constituency at Brodie's and at Wabtec in Kilmarnock. But I can assure the member that the route that the member makes reference to in Kilmarnock is one of the areas which we're looking at uh, to see how it could be fitted into the further improvement programme as we move forward into control period six. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. We managed to get all questions on the bulletin asked. Uh, we now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 19193 in the name of Ian Gray on Give Them Time campaign. I'll let members take their seats. <laughs>